Okay, we do Actually, have some more hot sauce, hot sauce bottles up here. Uh, they will be given away at the end of the session to whoever wants to come up and get them. Uh, in the meantime, though, we have for you tonight a very special speaker. Our speaker tonight has been developing since the age of 16 years old. He started working at Gilom Systems, which is Israel's largest database integrator. Please welcome the co-founder and CTO of SciSense, Eldad Farkash. Thank you very much for doing this uh, great and fun introduction. Uh, first time for me. Um, so, I am the CTO and founder of SciSense, and uh, tonight I would like to talk to you about what we do. I will show you the demo. And most of the time, I will be disorganized and driven to technology. So, if anyone feels uh, dizzy, raise your hand. I'll try to go back a few steps and explain it on a higher level. Before we start, I, so just to get it five here, um, how many of you are considering themselves programmers? Okay, that's nice. How many of you here um, are writing JavaScript? How many of you write in SQL? How many of you write assembly code? Nice, nice. How many of you write C code? Okay, great. So most of you will understand what I'm saying. The rest of you will get uh, hot sauce. <laughs> Please, you you know, get the feeling. Um, so some quick facts about Sizes. Uh, we came out of stealth mode. In, 2012, um, who raised a total of $50 million. The last round was a year ago from DFJ. Uh, those crazy guys who invented it, SpaceX and Tesla. So uh, we're considered their next crazy project and um, hope everyone failed them. Um, we have quite a few customers, 600 customers, ranging from NASA, Department of Defense, lots of cyber agencies, uh, web companies like eBay, uh, Wix, uh, lots of e-commerce, healthcare, Chinese, US, Middle East, everything, everything, at all, pretty much almost every kind of vertical market out there is using SciSense. Now, how, how, how come, right? Um, BI is vertical by nature. So we'll get to that later. Did anyone read the latest Forbes magazine? Did you read this article? No, you did? <coughs> okay, so you are living in 2018. This article wasn't written yet. Exactly. Just go downtown and you'll see all the ties. But um, a few years now we're going backwards. So 2010. Uh, most of us were born by then, I guess, if you're a C programmer. Um, you're, you know the term, how many of you know the term data warehouse? Okay, great. So, you remember how amazing it was uh, when the data warehouse was invented? Um, actually, we took some screenshots, uh, took us some time in Google uh, uh, to actually get to maybe page 90, page 100, it's very hard to find those uh, remarks. Uh, um, the data warehouse generates a high return of investment. Um, data warehouses and data mining predict the future. Data, the engine that powers BI, uh, and lots of interesting stuff. I, I remember that, it was very, it was exciting uh, uh, to get this uh, huge promise of, of, of having everything consolidated into one place and then each and every one of us ask questions using whatever we like, which is Excel back then, uh, to get answers. Now we go, you know, we jump back, we jump, uh, we jump forward in time and then just search for data warehouse again or go back to page one at Google and, and, and we get something like data warehouse failure is commonplace. Uh, the enterprise data warehouse is dead. Uh, 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 so a lot of death, a lot of suffering, a lot of, a lot of disappointment. And those five years uh, uh, were pretty much burning, it's pretty much like the first tech bubble. We were burning billions of dollars 
on building out these data warehouse promise and, and, and it all pretty much exploded in our face. So, so what do we do about it as, as vendors? We, we switch from the data warehouse to big data because it's cool, it's huge, the problems are massive, and, and, and we can restart everything. So it's like fashion, we just restart every five years and, and everybody forgot because five years is a lot of time. I do. And exactly, so, so a few engineers, uh, in, in, in anyone working on the West Coast, so you know you switch companies every day. So the guy who worked at Yahoo switched to Google, then to Facebook, then he fetched his friend, and then they decided this pair of couple of friends to go to their boss and tell him that, hey, let's open source this cool project. This was 10 years ago. And, and the boss talked to the marketing manager and he figured out, hey, wait, let's wait five years and then let's release it out to the public as, as, as Mac produced. And everybody will love it because it's written in Java and everybody kind of knows how to, to handle Java. Now, no disrespect to Hadoop, Hadoop is amazing. Uh, why is it amazing? Because it pretty much killed the data warehouse or it killed all those enterprise products that promised to solve the data problem. Now it's dead itself. So, going backwards to get forward, um, 2018, uh, we get this article. Um, this is me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, in a few years, we can, we can see the resemblance. Um, <coughs> But the point is that we're gonna have history repeating itself. Uh, I can guarantee that. And, and, and you know, if I'm wrong, you'll get free hot sauce for the rest of your life. But if you look at how big data works and how big data is tackled from <coughs> software and hardware perspective and from a discipline perspective, then you pretty much smell the same smell. It feels like the same <laughs> pain. Yes? Since you have predicated the presentation on some technical grounds, perhaps you might characterize Okay, we have a data warehouse expert. Um, so, that's, that, that's actually a good question. So now I'm gonna to get to the point. Why am I saying data warehouse fail? Why am I saying that big data project will fail? The bottom line is, how many data scientists on average work for a company? That's a great answer. So, I'll be, uh, 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 I'll say 20, okay? How many users tap into Hadoop and ask questions like they do in Excel today? One. One? <laughs> exactly. So this is why uh, I think, and, and this is why the claim big data project will fail because data is supposed to serve users. Uh, yes, it's great that it serves data scientists or uh, uh, super, super, super smart, too smart people who can understand the formulas. But at the end of the day, if you want to make decisions, if you want to base those decisions on data, you're just not invited to Hadoop. Same way you weren't invited to the data warehouse. It only serves a very small percentage of users in the company, and therefore, it is bound to fail. Of course, failure comes in many forms, and success can be debated. Some companies just need those 20 people to make everything work. And that's great for them, but most of us uh, uh, really rely on this process of this iterative process of trying things, figuring them out, trying again, repeating it over and over again in our laptop without having anyone <coughs> looking over our shoulder and counting the amount of dollars that we spend on those clusters. So if clusters will get very cheap, cheap, so cheap that you'll be able to embed them into the, into the hardware that you use on a daily basis, then big data will succeed. Right now, the stack that big data uses will, is, is just going, is, is completely the wrong vector. It's going on the opposite way. It's going backwards instead of forwards. Keep it a secret. So, no, I'm not gonna keep it a secret. This is why I came. I came to actually <coughs> open the book and I came to talk to you about uh, a different kind of technology, um, a new approach. It's, it's, it's not new, actually. It exists since the dawn of databases. So how many of you know about columnar databases? Great. Um, columnar. So let's say 15% of the people. 
people here know the term. Let me, I, I will get into that. You see this engine, this is SciSense, if you open the hood. Uh, most users download the product, never get to that, just like you never get to see your engine in your car because you have people who get paid to see the engine. Um, but since this is a technical analytics meetup, I have decided this time to actually take a look at SciSense from a technological perspective instead of just looking at it from the sales, marketing, and product perspective. So yes, we're going to get to the product, but first I would try to explain <coughs> what we do. So how do you build uh, data solutions today? You create up, and those clusters usually run on, on, on a virtual machine because virtual machines allow more users to tap and build programs on top of clusters. If you run into performance problems, it's probably just sorry guys. Uh, you just need someone to approve the budget. Usually, if you want to double the performance, you double the size of the cluster, uh, and then it goes on and on and on uh, uh, until you start seeing clusters, 500 nodes, 1,000 nodes, and, and pretty much millions of dollars spent on on solving basically a, a question answer problem. I ask a question and I want to get a result, just like I sell it for 99 bucks forever. In order to get, <clears throat> in order to get uh, uh, um, users tap into data that is outside of their reach today, because of, of, of the size, the magnitude, and, and, and let's say the, the, the breadth of the metadata that's out there, uh, you need to really restart the way you think about query kernels. And Sizen starts by building a query kernel that lives within the CPU cache. Before we get into that, how many of you know something about CPU caches except for the fact that everything flows through them? Okay, that's nice, nice. Um, so CPU caches, just for people who, who are less experienced with hardware, um, they have multiple parts. So we have the data part, which is usually between 64K to today 30 megabytes, uh, goes at levels from a one to a three. The numbers represent how close the cache sits physically to the uh, area of the CPU that actually computes the value. So in other words, the closer you are to the place that computes something, the faster it will take you to get the data from it. The problem with CPU caches is they're very expensive, so they're very small, and you pretty much can't touch them. So you cannot tell a CPU cache to store something. You cannot tell a CPU cache to pin something. You pretty much can't do anything about it. But you can write software in a way um, that takes a problem, usually a data problem, and chunks it up in a way that keeps the data inside the CPU cache, keeps the intermediates of the calculation inside the CPU cache, and therefore prevents the cache from spitting out the data back to RAM. Now we'll soon we'll understand why that's crucial and why that pretty much makes your CPU today uh, uh, sleepy most of the time, or drunk most of the time when you work with data problems. So in order to over oversimplify my assembly collect uh, my apologies. In order to simplify what we do, let's assume the data equals beer for a second. Um, so, if I want, if, if I'm, a, I'm a core of a CPU, okay, imagine that I'm a core of a CPU and I want to calculate something, so A plus B, and I need the value of A and I need the value of B. Now, I don't have it in my register, which would be my pocket. So I go to the fridge and take out cold beer the fridge is here, you don't see it, it's a black box, but it's, it's close by, and, and it's very fast, it's available, and, and, and I'm happy. So I can go on a reverse and do A plus B, A plus B, A plus B, just by moving to the fridge and back. Now, eventually, the fridge is, might be empty, or uh, 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 um, actually, since I did all this walking around, I eventually finished all the stuff. So when I go to the fridge and open it and get want to get the next bottle of beer, it's empty. What I do, I go downstairs, go over to the shop there and buy beer. Now I need to feed all of you. you. All of you need to get drunk tonight. So I do that over and over again. Eventually the, close, the store gets closed. 
This is where CPU caches end, and I go back to RAM. So RAM would be me going to our office downtown uh, uh, by foot. So I, you know, it's a great weather out there. I just go out there, and I have just two hands. So I repeat this process over and over again I get, until I get uh, 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 maybe 80 uh, 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 bottles of beer. So the first thing everybody needs to understand that for CPUs, RAM is too slow. So for a CPU, when it comes to the point where it needs data and it's not in the CPU cache, it waits. It waits a lot, a lot of time. When RAM is not available, it's, it's like, and then I have to go to the disk, it's like uh, flying to the moon and back, or flying back to Israel, buying beer, sitting in, 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 in you know, taking the beer, putting it in front of the sun, and waiting for it to get cold. That's actually kind of the, 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 the ratio between RAM and disk. In other words, it sucks, it's slow, and if CPU caches are empty and they don't have what I need next, um, then everything gets slow. Now, the problem with software is that we're all addicted to abstraction, and, and abstraction is beautiful, but there is nothing beautiful about slow software. And when we build software, the higher the language, the far we get from those principles. The less, uh, 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 no, the less tools we have to deal with those problems. Therefore, when you want to deal with this type of technology, you have today, unfortunately, to go to assembly or C. This is why Sizes is the first company that actually branched the LLVM open source compiler and introduced vectorization, in, vectorization into it. So the just-in-time compilation part of the query kernel, which solves a very particular problem, needs to compile your query, your SQL code, into something that CPUs understand without having to pay bribes to 10 layers of people of software abstraction. So I love JavaScript, and half of the company, half of the R&D are JavaScript developers, but you need to give those people a tool that will not, they won't have to give up the performance, they won't have to give up the scale, but still be able to talk with the language that they grew up with and with the language that they are productive with, because by the end of the day, we want to be productive, and, and with data, it's always about being productive. I have a question. Go ahead. Exactly. So I'm going back for a second. Um, yes. So the L1 would be your fridge, and, and, and so here, here's the detailed, overcomplicated slide. By by the end of the day, uh, this is my favorite column. Um, this is me uh, waiting. So yes, L1, L2, L3 are completely different dimensions, even though nobody can actually see the difference in distance, but they are. So. It's very important to be able to not just talk CPU caches, but to talk specifics about CPU caches. This is what in the academical field we call cache awareness. Now, if you look at, at, at this field, computer science, you'll see tons of amazing information. You'll see people trying to solve those problems by reinventing lots of stuff. And, and, and writing code in new ways that actually takes hardware as, as, as something that is not a black box. Um, now, cache awareness is important, but there are other two main issues that make software even slower. The other part is, is the other side of the cache. So we have half of the cache for data and the other half for instructions. Right? CPUs are dumb, they, they, have, they get a feed of instruction, and they have the data in the cache, and they take an instruction, take the data, tuck, 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 move on. Take an instruction, take the data, tuck, 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 move on. And this goes on and on until you upgrade your laptop. The problem with instruction sets is that CPUs need to kind of go through them before executing them in order to know how to prefetch data into the cache. Because if you wouldn't prefetch data before we need this data, we would basically wait forever. So if you would have to wait, you know, how many of you know what a hash table is? Okay, so imagine your hash table getting those 
continue design and architecture that has collision by design and you always wait. So it's like one huge link list every lookup. Just, just doesn't make sense. Therefore, getting data in advance means that I have, to, I have to go through the instructions in advance in order to know where the memory, what address they access so I can get it. This is a very problematic field. And, and, and actually in Israel, in Intel Israel has a huge group of people trying to write algorithms that live within the CPU in order to predict that. Now, the biggest problem with, with, with predicting is, is when you can't, right? Some, you know, some instructions, some situations just can't be predicted. We call that branch misprediction. The outcome of not being able to predict means that the branch, by the way, means if. So if you're writing JavaScript an if statement, it means that you need to know the outcome of your expression before you decide to which side of the branch to go. Um, when you write if, s, 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 this is like taking a hammer and you know, punching the CPU over and over again because it can't predict anything. It needs to calculate before it can decide what to do next. So, let me give you an example. If A is larger than B, then restart. Else, go on. I have a billion record uh, data set, and I need to go to each point and do this decision, right? I don't know when I reach the point where A is smaller or equal than B. So, I cannot assume that I just exit after a certain value. Clock speed means that the instruction will be faster. Memory bandwidth means that I can get data faster. Those two hardware factors cannot solve the prediction problem. There is a way to solve it. How? You calculate more. So instead of just waiting for the if statement to go left or right, let's just calculate both, right? Let's just do both options in advance. And when, I, when the CPU gets to the point where it needs to decide, it has those two options, and you just pick the one that is right. The problem with this approach is it's, it's, it costs a lot. Therefore, compilers will never do this by themselves. Of course, CPU engineers uh, have, they did come up with a lot of stuff that is supposed to make branch misprediction, you know, replace uh, control dependencies, which is the outcome, uh, uh, branch misprediction are the outcome of control dependencies, with what we call data dependencies. So. Data dependency means you pay more for calculating, but you get the prediction right. So, those two uh, 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 you know, sides of the coin, the instruction set part and the data cache part, are what CPUs are made of. The last part, uh, um, which is entirely about software, is how we manipulate that. So I've talked about hardware, and we've talked about how, how instruction sets run through the CPU, but OK, great, I'm a software engineer. Why should I care? How do I even tackle into this layer? Vectorization is a concept that exists since the dawn of, of you know, the first program that was written. Uh, vectorization was an idea and a concept that existed actually early CPU generations where folks on vectorization, of course, they, they, they died. Why did, why did they die? Because everybody knows that the bottleneck in data is disk. And database vendors focus on solving I.O. problems and not CPU problems because we didn't have RAM. So we didn't have the concept of putting data in RAM and having it go to the CPU wasn't even uh, 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 wasn't even uh, 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 possible back then. So RAM was like CPU caches today, a black box cache that you wouldn't even work on. Um, I'm sorry, but the notion that vectorization sort of hit a dead end, which is what I'm sort of hearing you characterize. I'm coming back in a second to the renaissance of vectorization. Well, renaissance sounds like it died at some point, because in fact, in scientific computing, uh, ever since the 1960s Iliac architecture, uh, vectorization has been prevalent both at the level of languages in like a Fortran, which although in antique power is a great deal of scientific computing, uh, all the way up to... How many Fortran programs are in here? That's <laughs> 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 you. Um, you know, I'm sorry, with all due respect, it's all very comical and such, but we're trying to sort of convey, you know, convey a technical content here. So uh, what I'm suggesting... 
suggesting is that numeric computing didn't abandon vector computing, and that has been prevalent this entire time, that its application perhaps hasn't been done in the uh, foreground for data is perhaps one of your innovations, but you know when, so you heard what you read. The transition, like I said, existed since the dawn of computers. The fact that the, fir no, the first time the transition became a mass, a crowded, or, or something that people like us can use was pretty much when MMX was invented, when SIMD instructions were pushed into CPUs. Now, there are two aspects of authorization, the software part and the hardware part. Without those SIMD instructions, SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. It means that CPUs, remember the A plus B? So CPUs can do four values of A and four values of B for the same amount of cycles that they did for one value in A and one value B. So I'm not saying, so back to the po your point, vectorization didn't exist in software and in databases, okay, um, maybe for 20 years. HPC, compilers, gaming, all of those type of uh, disciplines were trying to kind of uh, bypass this limitation until maybe seven, eight, ten years ago, CPU vendors finally woke up and said, hey, let's start putting those basic uh, registers into the CPU. Of course, it changed a lot, but really for us data guys, it didn't change anything. If you look at the fastest databases today, or two years ago, none of them even knows what vectorization is. Because, and this is by the way why you have those clusters today. This is why when you run the fastest Impala or the fastest Hive or the fastest whatever, it's, it's freaking slow. It's, it's, you wait 30 seconds, okay, to get a query back and you need to invest money to solve the problem, not by doing microscaling inside the CPU, but by doing scaling out and scaling up and actually treating uh, nodes as black boxes just like databases were treating them all the time. Actually, Sysense goes the other way around. We utilize vectorization. Um, we utilize microscaling. So we use vectorization to solve you know, good old data problems. Or in other words, if you write a SQL, eventually it is it's translated into a set of algorithms that are vectorized using Sysense. So you have three companies today that do that. You have IBM, you have Action, and you have sizes. So unfortunately, vectorization, yes, vectorization did not exist in data a few years back. It existed in academics, it existed in prototype CPUs, but it did not exist on your typical uh, x86 uh, architecture. It didn't exist on your typical Mac or PC machine. Now, I want to explain what vectorization really means. Let's forget about the hardware side for a minute. So I will try to explain what it means from the software perspective. Vectorization means that if you have a database, you have a data set, it has columns in it. Of course, we need to apply vertical fragmentation, which means convert rows into columns. Why? Because CPUs love aligned data. CPUs love that your array is of the same type. Why? Because we can store those chunks of arrays, or we can chop them up into chunks of arrays that are small enough to fit inside the CPU cache. This is why the first thing you need to do is convert rows into columns. Not because you say I.O. Of course you say I.O. So the common databases that we use, many of us use them even without knowing them, they say I.O. just by splitting data into columns. So the query kernel saves time by knowing which I.O. areas to tackle instead of going over every row and figuring out which values it needs to take up from, each, from every row because we just selected two fields out of 50. Everyone knows, uh, everyone knows what a star schema is? Okay, congratulations. So a star schema in BI, in, in the data world, when, we, when data engineers prepare data for regular users to use, they need to take the data through a process. The process eventually ends up as a star schema. Um, the star scheme is basically a denormalized data structure. It takes all the normalized tables that you have in your database and joins them so they end up as one huge table. Then we take on this table and decide which part of the table represents dimensions, 
like customers, products, time, which part of the table represents measures like sales, cost, speed, age, count age, those would be fields that represent, represent both dimension and measures. And we pre-plan in advance. So in other words, we try to figure out what are you going to ask as a user, and then we get the data, denormalize it, and, 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 and it's simple. And that's a data warehouse, basically. So data warehouse is the result of denormalizing all the data into one or few huge tables with can span over hundreds of rows. If you come from scientific computing, it can span over thousands of columns. And then we have users having this drag and drop effect, feeling like they actually run everything in real time because they actually ask a question, dragging and dropping on the screen, and it gets back fast. The problem is that the amount of time we invest to create this denormalized structure is just not worth it because by the time we're done denormalizing the data, spending a month, even years, we are pretty much half of the people who define the business problem are moved on to the next uh, 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 gig or uh, uh, um, it's not relevant anymore. So in other words, it takes too much time to prepare the data for a user to be able to use it. And this is where everything comes in. If you can get data faster, if you can get data more flexible, then you can save time not just by giving users the speed perception, but by doing data preparation faster. If you can solve the data preparation part, you can actually mesh up new data as you go and just make it cheaper and faster. Sysons is all about that. Sysons combines technology with the ability to mesh data up and take this mesh up data and build dashboards on top of it or use your own SQL or your own app <coughs> to access the data and ask questions. The difference is <coughs> the difference is, is the data is normalized. So but you're looking now at uh, anyone knows Crunchbase? So Crunchbase is, is uh, anyone knows TechCrunch? Okay, so TechCrunch, they have this, this company called Crunchbase. Their job is to like uh, uh, map all the startups out there. So if you look for a startup, look Sysons at, tech, at Crunchbase, you, you're supposed to get all the nasty details, or almost all the nasty details. Now the problem with Crunchbase is that it's kind of self-service, self-made, people-made database. So you have different people across the world. Some of them are still there, some of them are not, and, and each one contributing some insight. So one would contribute IPOs, another one would contribute static company details, Another one, usually from the West Coast, would contribute VC money raised. Now, how do you take care of your thing? It's constantly changing. Those are 70 tables. 70 tables, just to map the startups in. Uh, massive amounts of data and massive amounts of metadata. How do you take this and create uh, something that people can analyze, anyone, without having to go through data preparation processes? And this is the, the beauty about vectorization, about speed, about hardware, about going down to the CPU cache because it makes it flexible. It makes it, it makes it, you know, let's say safer and, 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 and maybe stupid proof or bulletproof or it allows you to be productive. It allows you to ask questions you couldn't ask before without having 10 people preparing the data for you. Now, how much time do I have? Take your time. Okay. So I want to show you the product, and then we can, you know, jump back and forth and have can have a continued debate uh, uh, on how much transition is used or about what you guys need. Um, so what you're saying is you have to pre-populate it. So we all have to pre-populate, but if the, the, the problem with, with populating is, is those joins that I need to run, is those aggregations that I need to do, the sorting or ordering of the data that I have to make. Those are those shortcuts that databases apply in order to save time. So if I want to have sales over month, over the last few months, and the data is not sorted by month, then I pretty much need to go through all the data. So databases sort the data. Sorting costs like having 10,000 people asking unique questions. So you spend 
those huge amounts of resources just to prepare the data so a few people can ask something because it's too expensive. So you're looking at the Elastic View Manager. This is the measure of environment. The first principle of Elastic View is that you don't need to understand how databases work. You don't need to understand the notion of indexes. You don't need to be a DBA. And of course, you don't need to understand everything of what I just said in the last 15 minutes. Um, you need to understand metadata. So we call those people data heroes because those new DBAs um, are focused on solving business problems. Usually their boss or multiple bosses, like multiple data sources, are sitting with the business level. If you look at BI, data warehouse, after this huge failure, what really changed was where the budget goes. So today, if I want to buy Tableau, or ClickView, or SciSense, I don't go to the IT manager anymore. The IT manager can say, listen, this is not working, don't buy it. But the IT manager cannot decide what to buy. It can decide what not to buy. The business manager or the user, the data analyst, the data scientist, he picks up the product. He decides at the end of the day what to use because it's up to him to bring back the results, to bring back the numbers. So the first principle is that we use speed and technology not just to scale in size, but to save you and remove a lot of principles that we were taught are the basics of BI or data, we don't need them anymore. So if we can join data fast, why not do it during query time? Why denormalize the data? So if we don't need to do joins, why do they know what a foreign primary key means? Why do I need to know what a left, right, inner, outer joints are? I don't. I just need to know metadata, which means I need to know that a field coming from Salesforce, customer name, and a field coming from Hadoop, customer, uh, uh, how many likes it did, represent the same dimension, okay? Once I drag and drop those two fields up on each other, that's it. Then my users, so I'm the data hero, now I'm flipping to the users, they can connect to the database and just combine customers over account hits without having to write the SQL or understand the performance implications of the joints. Okay, so we must create a new database. Since we're a database company, we're first, you know, first and foremost, we're a database company. Yes, we speak SQL 2003, SQL 99, uh, um, multi-dimensional extensions, just a small comment. I was part of the team that created the first Polar compiler. Um, great times, it was maybe 16 years ago. Um, what we did back then in order to give you the perception of speed is to pre-aggregate and pre-calculate everything in advance. So as users, you could write the drop in Excel, if you all remember uh, 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 um, the first, first, first Microsoft version. It was amazing. It was returning instantly until, until we wanted to, for example, do a distinct count. Distinct count doesn't work. We can trick the, the, the database into pre-calculating because a distinct count today and a distinct count yesterday and any distinct count that we do requires me as a query kernel to actually go through the unique items and calculate them. I can't cheat, I can't aggregate and then make aggregations. Just doesn't work. So it's not just speed, it's not just flexibility, it's not just throwing away old terms. It's also about adding to the database new capabilities. So scientific computing, great, amazing area. I will take 10% of it. Statistics, predictive, clustering, and I would assume this is something that every user should be able to use. If you solve the speed problem and you extend SQL, then suddenly a lot of users that don't even know what statistics means can actually apply them by looking at an example, or looking at a dashboard, or looking at what someone else did. So let's start with picking a data source. Someone mentioned MS Access. I think it was the MS Access guy. He forgot. Or embarrassed. I would I mean anyone knows what MS Access is? So this is kind of a retro example. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen anyone actually using data on top of MS Access, but it's kind of a nostalgic way to take us back. So I'm gonna pick a few tables. I'm a data hero. Uh, 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 someone came to me and asked me to do some analysis on table, on, on some table. Um, 
So I pick some tables and I want to add some transactions to it. So I pick two tables that represent transactions. So what I see here is a model, head of table that I added. Now, since it came from the same database, and we know that primary foreign keys exist there, we connected the dots together. Simple. Let's build the Elastic Cube. Building the Elastic Cube means we do all the process behind the scenes. We import the data, we apply vertical fragmentation, we compress the data, and we memory map it. Memory mapping is important for us because we want to bypass the operating system buffer. We can get into the layer or in the QA session, but with databases, a lot of algorithms are random by nature, so it's very hard sometimes to use the whole software stack because it just gets too slow. So we bypass that. In other words, we don't use the way uh, most of the software today is reading data from disk. This is how your operating system actually reads your executable into RAM. So when you double click on a, on a program, this is what the operating system does. It memory maps your process. So we're building the Elastic Cube, now we're done. It took us about 30 seconds. Um, not because we're so great, we are great, but because it's just not a lot of data. But the important part is that we didn't do any tricks behind the scenes like we did back then, 16 years ago. We did not you know, analyze the data, we did not create the star scheme, we did not sort the data, we did not aggregate nothing. We just imported the data. Now, if I flip over and do a billion record test or a five billion record test, the speed would be, faster than anything you've seen. So I can give you examples like eBay doing five billion rows over 2,000 people on a single node. I can give you examples of taking 80 Hadoop nodes and turning them into one. But that would be, by the end of the day, just a marketing pitch. The really interesting part, for me personally, is that once I've done building the Elastic Cube, I can start creating dashboard on top of the data and have access to all of the metadata unless someone in the company decided that I'm not allowed to see it. If I'm allowed to, to have access to some kind of metadata, then I can use it. That's the, the basic principle that Tyson's focuses on. So we start by creating a new widget, and as you can see, we have access to the metadata. Now we have different tables. Usually when you work with BI and with analytics, it's not allowed. So when you come to the point where you pick a few fields from different tables, you'll see a screen coming in front of you telling you, listen, you need to create a view or you need to denormalize those fields into one table so the widget can work on them. Why? Again, you don't want to join the data during query time. So we do the join once on all of the tables. Usually the result is if you anyone been using ClickView? No. Great. Anyone be using Tableau? Okay, so with Tableau, usually the, the, the outcome is that you don't get an answer. You just wait. Okay, so you open the task explorer and just get nasty with it. Um, so I'm going to add the class field. Um, the resolution is, is, is okay. And I'm going to go to a different table and do some count on contact ID. Of course, every field has all sorts of aggregation types, all sorts of filters. You can do, you know, you can treat metadata in many forms and ways. Usually it depends on what you need when you ask the question or when you do the widget. So in other words, you cannot pre-think or predefine what to do with the field. It needs to be flexible. Anything you need to do on top of it needs to be done by the user. This is why most of the functionality we're used to see today in databases is exposed to the user. Again, we use speed to solve a user problem, not just a scale problem. And I go on and I add those widgets. Let's add some revenue. And go on. Let's shortcut. Let's copy and paste a few widgets. Let's get into one of the widgets and let's add drag and drop the measure and then add the dimension 
let's say, what else do we have here? Um, time. And then let's maybe look at the pie chart. No, that wouldn't be the right widget to use. So I'll switch to a different widget. Then I can drop it back. And it goes on and on. And every time you click on the screen and do something, you have maybe one, two, or 10 SQL queries running behind the scene against the database to support your play, to support your experiment with this. As a user, you don't care about speed, you don't care about the SQL, you don't care about what's happening in the text, in the backend. What you do care about is responsiveness. So when you read your new site, you, you care about having the page coming up in three seconds. It's not your, your concern to deal with the challenge that uh, we people have in the back end in order to make it responsive. So responsive unlike performance means that instead of me getting happy about solving, you know, improving performance by 200%, I have users being able to add twice the amount of widgets and get twice the amount of insights while he's using the dashboard. In other words, speed gets you more insight because you can add more widgets and filter them and play with them, which is something that you could not do before. This is why companies like Cisco, companies like Wix, companies like eBay, and, and, and many other type of companies see this type of products as some kind of agile dashboarding productivity tools they are just being pushed down to users. So we're talking about installing, not in physically installing, but <coughs> exposing thousands of users to data they could see before. And this is about it, folks. Uh, this, is, this is what Sciences is. It starts with, with technology, it starts with going very deep, and it ends up by building a product that is not meant for scientists, it's meant for most of you guys here. You can take the dashboard, it's open, so it's JavaScript, HTML5, it's responsive, it works in your browser, it works in your mobile device, it works everywhere. You can tweak it, play it, you know, do whatever you love with it. You can take the D3 out of it and play with it. You can take the high charts out of it and play with it. It's, it's, it's supposed to be flexible so people can take this first step and then turn it into something they think fits their specific need. This is it in a nutshell. So, not those two yet, but we've just introduced Splunk and MongoDB. Uh, we are going to introduce uh, Spark very soon, but not the data sources you mentioned yet. So if you would like to get this data into SciSense, you need to do an intermediate step. Can I, can I write my own, like, shim in between? Of course. Okay. It's, it's, everything is API. Every layer is, is, is you can tap into it very fast. Before I take the next question, I just want to mention that all those bottles of hot sauce right after our QA, feel free to come up and grab them. There you go. Yes. Is there a, is there a uh, query language or API that can be used before we access the data? Yes, so of course we support C, C++, then we support Java, Scala, uh, uh, JavaScript, <coughs> Ruby on Rails. Um, I'm sorry if I forgot someone. Uh, C sharp, little C sharp, yes, Python, yes. Uh -huh. little. Erlang, not. Sorry, but C sharp, to your case. Yes, yes, of course. The whole, the whole UI, everything you see, or you know, the projector is a bit uh, having a resolution problem here, but everything you see is JavaScript. So. Um, Any of it is open source, you said. No, it's not open source. It's going to be, a lot of it going to be open source. Um, it's, it's not open source in the way that uh, the license is, is uh, MIT. If you buy the product, it's open source, so you can change it and OEM it and white label it and embed it into your own software, your own solution. Sciences is not an open source company. Um, so, but 
and some layers of the of the software are open source. AWS? Of course, of course. Uh, uh, we are actually you know, Amazon partner, Rackspace partner, a uh, huge amount of customers are using uh, Amazon, of course. Okay, last question. Uh, just going back to the MIT license, so I can take it a user against my data, uh, but I can't. Can I uh, take it back to the user against So you can use it against your own data, but you cannot build a product on top of it and give it for free. Yes, you can. So if you buy the license, you can display the data on your website with your user interface without having anyone knowing about what any chip or size it is. Okay. Uh, you have the license in private I don't know. <coughs> no, kidding. Actually not. I'm the CTO, so you have to talk to the sales guys. But I can tell you that it's a subscription-based licensing, so we need to earn your trust every year. You pay a yearly subscription, Starts with 10k, goes up to hundreds of thousands, and it is cheap. It's very cheap. Okay, that's all the time we have for tonight. Uh, but Eldad will be here for one-on-one -on -one questions. Feel free to come up, talk to him. Feel free to grab some hot sauce. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Eldad. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, the official new version is 575. So I think someone here, you, uh, one-on-one -on -one hot sauce. <laughs>